All right. Well, here's the thing. So we'll, I'll, I'll mention a few things from the get-go. We're going to see how this Reformation cause, which we've already taken a look at in Germany, in, in Switzerland, and in France, we're going to see how it ends up on the shores of that little island, uh, which uh, constitutes the United Kingdom, actually, you know, a couple of islands up there. And I want to say a few things about Thomas Cranmer from the get-go in comparison to the other reformers. You look at a guy like Martin Luther and you go, it's not hard to see how this man was the mighty reformer that he was. He had so much gumption. He had so much conviction. He was so bold. He had this charisma that was overwhelming and an entire you know, nation or really series of kingdoms uh, really took to. So we get Martin Luther. It's similar with John Calvin. You go, Calvin was so brilliant. He was so sharp. He could uh, cut with a razor's edge, you know, when he was dealing with the interpretation of scripture, when he's dealing with theology. His brilliance commend him to being a great reformer. Thomas Cranmer was neither of those things. It's not to say he wasn't a bright guy. He absolutely was. But he wasn't the genius that Calvin was. Likewise, Thomas Cranmer, you're going to see a very different kind of reformer than Martin Luther. Martin Luther, bold as can be, here I stand, I can do no other, kill me if you want. You know, people have to kidnap him and put him in hiding before, you know, he's, he's off the, the stage of world events. Well, Thomas Cranmer is different than both of those men. And I want to say this, no or rather, neither of those two other reformers, Luther or Calvin, could have likely done what Cranmer did in England. Because Cranmer had to be a reformer in the midst of the reign of a total tyrant. And that's just different. See, Germany was a place where everything was divided up by multiple princes and kings. And yes, the Holy Roman Emperor kind of had sway over the whole thing, but people could push back. In Henry VIII's England, you don't have that. And I think that's the, the caveat that you've got to have in mind when you consider his Reformation program. This is a man who is dealing with a tyrant and getting as much reforming done as possible while he's doing it. So we're going to look at the life of Thomas Cranmer. I have my doubts that we're going to make it to John Knox today, so it might have to wait till next time because it is such an interesting story. We'll look at his early life. Look at his life as a diplomat, eventually the archbishop, and then finally Cranmer the martyr. And um, so here we go. You look at the Tudor period in England, and it's this timeline right here, roughly 1485 to 1603, um, takes you from, from Henry VII to Elizabeth I. And we're going to focus primarily on the life of Thomas Cranmer, which is going to span mainly Henry VIII's lifetime. And he will, he will also be around into the, the reign of Bloody Mary, who ultimately claims his life. Uh, we'll note that the defining document for the Anglican Church, which is reformed in its origins, is the 39 Articles. This is their Westminster Confession, if you will. And it undergoes development. It begins as lesser articles, 10 articles, and grows into the 39, which is still a much smaller doctrinal statement than what we have in the Westminster Standards. 196 questions in the larger catechism, 33 chapters with sub points in our confession. So it's, it, it's, it's a smaller thing, but it's married to this thing called the Book of Common Prayer. So you'll see that in the course of time here. But there you have Henry VIII. He is, well, he's something else. So here, here we go. Let's get, get busy. So this is England and, and Wales and Scotland and Ireland. Um, it, pretty familiar map. Um, basically, the same sorts of boundaries existed even then. And the main cities that will come to uh, bear are Canterbury, which is where um, the Archbishop of England in the Roman Catholic Church would preside from. And then Cambridge and Oxford are going to be, of course, the intellectual capitals of that island in London, the political capital even at that time. So if you look at a, an old picture of, of London, uh, the London area, <laughs> You see Westminster Cathedral on the left and Whitehall Palace on the right. And that was one of the palaces owned by Henry VIII. Now you see this really close marriage between the, the, the flagship church in the king's palace. It's almost reminiscent of Solomon's palace 
being right next to God's temple on the holy hill. And that gives you some sense of this close proximity between church and state that existed in England at the time and persisted there for quite some time. And so we begin with uh, the, the early life of Thomas Cranmer. So he's born into lower nobility. That means you have some capacity for education, some capacity potentially for a life of nobility yourself, whether in the clergy or in the political sphere. And um, that's what we'd expect from anyone who uh, becomes a well-known figure at the time. I'm born in 1489. Now, here's the thing. Cranmer goes to Cambridge. That's where he's, he's going to be educated, and he's going to be educated along religious lines. But very early in his career, he uh, meets a uh, woman at the tavern slash inn by the name of Joan, and he marries her. Now, that right there would spell the end of any career in the clergy, to be married to somebody. You just, that's not an option at the time. It was expected that all clergymen would be um, celibate. So this shows you something about Cranmer. I mean, he was willing to essentially give it all up for what you consider to be a normal life of marriage, uh, but she ends up passing away after one year. And so that enables him to go back onto a course of pursuit of, um, you know, some sort of religious vocation. And he does that, in fact. At Cambridge, he ends up with a position of oversight, um, not particularly prestigious necessarily, but he's well on his way to um, something in the realm of either Christian education or the priesthood or something like that. Well, here's what happens in 1529. Um, the particular locale where, where uh, Cranmer was living um, had been struck with the plague. Basically, what you do at that time when the plague would come around, seeing as it would literally claim the lives of one in every three people, is you just shut down the town and people would all go to the, the locales next door. If you had family somewhere, you'd go there, but you'd shut the whole town down. People would just leave. And they, they weren't at that time keen on how the plague was getting spread. They, they didn't understand, as, as, I, as I understand it, that it was being spread by rats. But um, that's what they would do. And this led to a totally unexpected meeting. He goes to an acquaintance house where two of the king's counselors are present. And there's this major issue that is going on. And the major issue is going to be King Henry VIII's marriage, his wives, and what to do about it. Now, before I tell you the specific issue, Cranmer's at this meeting, and he's just talking with pals. Imagine being at an off-the-cuff meeting where uh, you're just talking with your buddies, and there are people he knew from Cambridge in his period of education there, and he goes, hey, well, here's what I think. I think the person to decide whether or not the king can remarry or marry his sister's wife should be Bible scholars. They're the people who know the Bible. They're the, the Bible's the ultimate authority. They should be the ones answering this difficult question about the king's marriage. And he also says that as regards the church here in England, the highest authority here in England is not the Pope. The Pope has no civil authority. Ultimately, the king should be the highest authority here in England. He's just talking to his pals. Well, his buddies go and talk to Henry VIII. And Henry VIII says, yeah, that's what I think. I like this guy, Thomas Cranmer. Bring him to me. Now, I'm going to explain a little bit about the situation with Henry VIII. You read a little bit about it, but it all centers around this woman, Catherine of Aragon. And poor Catherine, I mean, she really got mixed up with the wrong family. I'll tell you that right now. She marries Arthur which is the first son in line to the throne. So she is going to be prepared to be the Queen of England, marrying the older brother of Henry VIII, Arthur. Okay? She is from Spain. Spain is a Catholic country. She is a Catholic. And she's marrying into this royal house in England at the time. And England is also Catholic. So no problem, all right? Well, here's the problem. Arthur dies shortly into their marriage, I believe less than a year into the marriage. Arthur has no uh, children with Catherine of Aragon. And 
there's this problem of Leviticus 20, verse 21, which says that a man is not to marry his brother's wife. Okay? But here's the thing. For Henry to make good on this political alliance with Spain and the people in the South Spain is extremely powerful at this time. This is when the Spanish are finding America. This is when the Spanish are at the height of their strength in the world. England wants this connection. So Henry's dad, which is Henry VII, he says, listen, just wait around for my second son. So she waits for six years to be married to the next in line in this household. And she marries Henry at 19 years of age. And these two are lined up to be king and queen of England. Now, here's the thing. In order to make this happen, they need special approval from the Pope to say that that first marriage to Arthur was not a real marriage. Why was it a real marriage? Uh, They didn't consummate it. And who can say they did? So they didn't have any kids. And so the Pope uses his authority fundamentally to say that marriage is wiped away. It's not a real marriage. Therefore, you're not really marrying your sisters, your sister-in-law, or your husband's, or your, your brother's wife. You're just marrying a lady who was never really married to her older brother. You guys get it? And so the Pope jumps in and saves the day, at least first time around. But here's the challenge, and I thought we'd look at it for a little bit. I thought I'd get your guys' opinion, in fact. Somebody, if you'd like to read uh, the scripture on the left at the top, somebody read that for me. Anybody but me. If there is a man who takes his brother's wife, it is the Lord. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They will be childless. So there's this curse sitting over it. What's that? Well, so, see, but this law, that's kind of be the question. Does this law apply to your brother's wife while she's married to your brother? If so, why would you even need to put that law out there? Because that would just be adultery, and the Bible already condemns that. In fact, that same chapter already condemns adultery generally. Well, here's the thing, though. There's this other scripture, Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 6. And by the way, rabbis have debated this for years. When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself, a wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. So how do you reconcile these two things? I'm curious. I'd love to have your theories. One theory was actually just voiced that these verses only here condemn marriage to a brother's wife while the brother is alive, in which case it's an explicit instance of adultery. And God is just being uh, really clear (laughs) that you're not to commit adultery in that instance. But it seems surprising because adultery is generally already condemned. Anyone else? How would you reconcile these? Okay, so that's another one. But... fair, but I mean, this is the same chapter that condemns, you know, same-sex behavior. This is the same chapter that condemns bestiality. I don't think we would want to say those are just laws for Israel. It says his name will not be brought out of Israel. So it's specific to Israel. Is that that what you're saying? Oh, this one over here. So you're saying that essentially you never should marry your brother's wife, except in Israel they had one exception, only... So this is strictly for Israel, you're saying? So that's one theory. Anybody else? <laughs> All right, well, I'll throw out a few others. One theory is that if your brother had children, then you were not supposed to end up with your brother's wife because then they had clearly become a family unit and you would be wrecking that and confusing that whereas if he didn't have children it was something it was so important in israel that land inheritance was passed on to a family name that your brother really needed to have a child and in that instance it's going to be okay another theory is that in general you're never to marry your brother's wife um, but the only exceptional instance over here is 
if she, he has no children, in which case then the duty must be performed so that his wife has someone to take care of him, someone to provide for the family, and a family name persists. In which case, that's exceptional. They'll also point out that the particular way that this sin is described is that it's abhorrent. That ri- word really means unclean, ritually unclean. It, that's actually a very low level of moral problematicness in uh, the Levitical Code, in which case it is a, uh, a ceremonial impurity that one incurs, which implies that in certain circumstances that impurity wouldn't be contracted, namely in the instance of when you're fulfilling what's happening over here. But no matter what you do, the simplest thing in most instances would just be to not end up with your brother's wife, okay? That would be the simplest thing in most instances and allow her to marry anyone else who's available. Another reconciliation, by the way, is this. You never marry your brother's wife, but a broader kinsman can. Sometimes the word brother, and not infrequently actually in um, the Hebrew scriptures, can mean any male uh, family relation, like Ruth and Boaz. Boaz is the nearest of kin, family relation. He's not Ruth's brother, but he redeems this woman as his wife, in which case it's saying not that your brother can marry your, um, your wife, but that your cousin, your male cousin, or male first or second cousin or something like that can. But these are the challenges that people have been dealing with for thousands of years. So, we can see why it's challenging. We can see why Bible scholars would be called upon to deal with this difficult question. And so, here's the problem, though. Henry marries Catherine of Aragon, but guess what? She can't have a male child. And do you know what Henry's thinking? Oh, no. Exactly what it says up here is happening to me. They will be childless. I've incurred the curse. I never should have done that. I never should have ended up with Catherine of Aragon, my brother's wife. Now, in fact, they actually do have a child. They have a girl named Mary. We'll come back to her. But that's not what he's looking for. Now, let me ask you this. The whole world is weighing in on this problem. What do you guys think Luther suggested as the solution to the problem once Henry marries Catherine of Aragon and can't have a child. Any theories? You'll never guess. Luther suggests something you would never suggest. And this is going to give you just some sense of how challenging this problem was in that world. See, the whole stability of the nation depended on having a clear air. If you don't have that, civil war can erupt. You know, crazy things can happen. Starvation, people die. Luther says, simple, he should have two wives. He suggested bigamy as a solution. And see, again, this would be something you're like, are you kidding me? And in that world, that was something that would come to people's mind. I can't say it's Luther's best moment, and that's for sure. And so what you see is this international crisis going on. By the way, Henry VIII hated Martin Luther. If Martin Luther had lived in Henry VIII's country, there's no way he would have survived. There's no way. It's because as you're going to see, Henry VIII really cannot deal with any big personalities around him. So here we go. Thomas Cranmer gets called into the service of the king because he had the right answer. You ought to go to the scholars. You ought not to go to the pope who's just some random dude. And here's what he does. He gathers 160 Cambridge scholars, Bible scholars, to search the scriptures. Lo and behold, they come to the conclusion that, in fact, Henry VIII can marry his brother's wife. And the the issue is that he he needs an annulment. It needs to be recognized that that relationship was never legitimate. This is the scholarly opinion. I told you Luther's opinion. But here's the thing. They've got to clear it with the Pope. And that day, you just could not go around marrying whoever you wanted without papal approval. So, Cranmer gets sent as a diplomat on behalf of England to go and talk to the Pope. Now, I'll show you the spider web of craziness going on in the world. Catherine of Aragon, from Spain. Henry VIII, England. She's moved to England. Charles V is the Holy Roman Emperor. He's the one that Martin Luther stood up to. You guys remember him? And then you've got Pope Clement VII right down here in Rome, okay? So let me explain a few things. 
Catherine of Aragon is Charles V's aunt. Charles V is plenty of a playboy himself, but he's not going to have his aunt being disrespected and passed around. Okay, so that's the first thing. Catherine is married to Henry VIII now. That's a complex relationship. And this one additional piece is this. Charles is in the middle of expanding his kingdom south into southern Italy. And he's just essentially sacked these Italian states up here and he's come into Rome. Now, the Pope is a little bit afraid of Charles V, as you might imagine. Charles could be like, I'm the Holy Roman Emperor. I'm not too hot on you. Um, we're going to replace you. There's going to be a different Pope. This is the sort of thing that could happen. What Henry needs is an annulment now of this second marriage that he's in from Pope Clement VII. That's what he needs. He needs it desperately. He needs the Pope to say, in fact, my marriage to Catherine of Aragon isn't legitimate either so that he can go and find someone else to marry and have an heir. So you look at this web of complexity here. And Cranmer is the guy for the job. Can you imagine being sent with that job? I need you to go talk to this guy who is in danger from this guy, who is the nephew to my wife and convince this guy to annul my marriage to this woman whom this guy really likes and is currently got you cooped up like a bird in a cage. Very complicated mission. Well, Cranmer travels through France. Along the way, stops at the University of Paris. Along the way, stops at all the institutions of learning, attempting to gain agreement from scholars that even this second marriage ought properly to be annulled. Because now guess what they're arguing? They're arguing, I never should have married my brother's wife in the first place. A man can't marry his brother's wife. That's what the law says. So they're arguing the very reverse of what they'd said before to get rid of this marriage. And so they end up down in um, the Pope's uh, presence to argue that. Well, here's how things shake out. The Pope says, I'm not going to give you an annulment. I just won't do it. But I'll give you freedom to consult with all the scholars of Rome and all across Europe. And they can come to the conclusion that he is deserving of an annulment. And I won't say anything about it. That was his measured attempt to try to balance everything. And in fact, that's what all the scholars do. They all agree. Never should have married his brother's wife in the first place. That's what they decide. Well, during this time, uh, the playboy, King Henry VIII, is discovered another love interest. Now it's a woman by the name of Anne Boleyn. She is part of a, a noble family, as you'd expect. He had already been with Anne's older sister, but she played hard to get a little bit more than her older sister did, which really captivated, I guess, Henry's interest. And you have to understand, this guy could do whatever he wanted, minus this whole thing with this pesky pope not doing what he wants with his marriage. And so here's the thing, though. Anne Boleyn gets convinced of evangelicalism and Protestantism. In fact, Cranmer is a major part of that. She gets persuaded of Luther's perspective and Calvin's perspective. And that's going to make a big difference as things shake out in the long run. So while this is going on, this love interest is getting cultivated. Thomas Cramer has proven so useful to King Henry VIII that he makes him an ambassador to Charles V and sends him back onto the continent of Europe to go and be his representative to the Holy Roman Empire at the time, which is Austria, Germany, and really Spain. They're all in the cahoots together. Um, basically, Charles V is trying to go to war with the, the Muslims in Turkey who are making advances from the Ottoman Empire, really the Turkish Empire, into England at the time. And he is supposed to go with the message that we're not going to give you any financial aid. Like, he gives these impossible missions to Thomas Cranmer, and he really wants it and needs it. So Cranmer drags his feet and gets there as late as he possibly can, spends time in central Germany, in Nuremberg, where he encounters the reformer Andreas Osiander, uh, one of those guys who is distinctly on the side of evangelical religion. And he falls in love with Osiander's niece, Margaret. He marries Margaret while on the continent of Europe, unbeknownst to anyone in England. Now he is married to a legitimate bona fide reformer's daughter, okay? 
He does, by the way, at the very last minute, tell Charles V that they can't give them any money, and he holds out as long as he possibly can before he tells them that. And somehow, he gets home alive, but his trip gets cut short. Anne ends up pregnant, Anne Boleyn, with Elizabeth. This has happened out of wedlock. Now, that wasn't uncommon. I mean, he actually already had mistresses and children with mistresses. But in order for this kid to be the heir, who might be a boy, they're thinking in their mind, we got to be married. Well, here's what happens. Immediately, the king declares that the new archbishop, because the archbishop gratuitously died at the same time, of Canterbury, the highest office in the Catholic Church in England, is Thomas Cranmer. Guess what? Thomas Cranmer's married. Priests, much less archbishops, aren't supposed to be married, but it's secret. So the story goes, the story goes that Thomas Cranmer would bring his wife Margaret around all over the place in a crate that he claimed to have like all of his personal belongings and things like that. There are all sorts of stories. Who knows if they're true, pseudepigraphal, or what? But all of a sudden you have this married archbishop representative of the Pope in England, and it's Thomas Cranmer. Now, he manages to secure papal approval for this wedding, which is incredible. That's a a remarkable feat. But right after it happens, this is when Henry VIII just kind of goes off the rails, and he, he passes the act of supremacy, declaring himself to be the highest office in the church in England. That is to say, the Church of England is under the king not under the Pope. He has Sir Thomas More executed, generally regarded to be one of the more um, you know, insightful and useful uh, dignitaries of really p- political leaders who is Roman Catholic in England. And he really stood up to Henry VIII. And he just has him killed. And that's what we're looking at here. So now what you have is a married representative of the Pope in this office of Archbishop, secretly, You have a king claiming sovereign authority, not just over his realm in the political sphere, but in the church. And this is the bizarre situation in the 1530s in England. Now, of course, that's going to put everybody at odds with Rome, but this is when the English Reformation really begins. Thomas Cranmer has been exposed to the Lutheran teaching on justification. And the beginning articles of the Church of England are just six articles. Six articles defining the doctrine of the church, of which justification is one. The English Bible, which had already been translated into English by uh, Tyndale, um, in which Henry VIII attempted to suppress when he was still kind of working with the Roman Catholics, the English Bible is more widely being read, and Thomas Cranmer is securing the freedom of the people to do that. And he develops the Bishop's Book, which will eventually become the Book of Common Prayer. And let me just give you some statistics. Out of 331 clergy, see, he actually did the work of surveying 331 clergy. Only 171 of them could tell you all 10 commandments. So you're talking about 331 men who are priests in the church, your local minister. Half of them. Could tell you the Ten Commandments. 27 of them couldn't tell you who the author of the Lord's Prayer was. Lord's Prayer. 30 of them couldn't find the Lord's Prayer in Scripture, so they didn't know where it was. And in fact, to tell you, you know, parallel conditions, you know what they say about the clergy in Scotland? The clergy in Scotland, the majority of them believed that the New Testament was a book that had been written by Martin Luther because they knew about the Luther Bible. Their job generally did not entail preaching the scriptures ever. Generally did not involve expounding the scriptures ever. And so these are radical, radical moves. The Bishop's book gave uh, a lectionary of readings that people would read throughout the year, 52 Sundays of the year, because here's the problem. Most of those men didn't know their Bible at all. And at least Cranmer and the people, the scholars he were, was working with knew it well enough to be like, yeah, you'd want to read these essential scriptures throughout the course of a year. 
These are the sorts of things that are happening in England through Cranmer. Now here's the thing. As time goes on, and as Anne Boleyn is herself uh, incapable of, um, I'm trying to think, yeah, yes, incapable of birthing a, a, a male heir, Henry VIII loses interest with her. Now, how are you going to get out of this one? How are you going to get out of this marriage? You've been messing around with marriages all the time. Well, he accuses her of adultery and treason. And here's how the story goes. He puts her in the tower, which is the great prison that they had in London. And it was Cranmer's job, of all people, to extract from her a confession of guilt. This, this is a girl that he was instrumental in leading to the Reformation cause the evangelical faith. Nobody knows what happened in that meeting. What he does is he goes there and he talks with her and the accounts go that she comes down and uh, as if she's been set free. She doesn't look somber. She doesn't look sad. She knows she's going to get executed. Nobody knows what was said. There seems to have been some sense on the part of Anne Boleyn, perhaps, that although she was going to die and there was really no way out of it, the Reformation cause wasn't necessarily going to die with her. And that being said, given her confidence with which she goes into it, it doesn't appear that Thomas Cranmer forced her to do anything, but he might have very well laid out the situation and been like, you know who you're dealing with. You're not probably going to live. So here are your options. And essentially, she chose her own death uh, rather volitionally. And she was behe beheaded, I believe. And that's a picture of it. So this leads to yet more wives. From 1536 to 1547, you've got Jane Seymour. She dies in birth, and she finally produces a male child to be raised without his mother, Edward. All right. After that, he marries Anne of Cleves. I'll tell you that story briefly. Cranmer is busy trying to create and forge a political alliance between the North German states that are Lutheran and the English. Anne of Cleves comes from that region of the world, and he wants to see some sort of political alliance so that the Reformation cause can have a unified front in the north from England through Germany. And so he suggests Anne of Cleves. It's cruel to suggest anyone as a wife to Henry VIII, but he's trying to work through this. Well, he had some sort of picture or painting of Anne of Cleves, and he takes a look and he's like, yeah, okay, let's do this. So she comes over. Apparently that picture that had been painted was not accurate to the bride who showed up. But he's like, uh-uh, no bueno. And she was up there for just a little while and they did get an annulment and I, I'm pretty sure nothing happened there. So it was of the sort that there was um, probably no consummation. That's followed by Catherine Howard. And Catherine Howard actually was all of the things that Anna, Anne Boleyn was accused of. She was a total playgirl. I don't know how insane you would have to be to be racing around London with other men when you're married to Henry VIII, of all people. You really are not thinking that one through. So she was executed. And his final wife, Catherine Parr, uh, he, he lives out his days with her. But there, I mean, at this point, I mean, this is how many wives? It's just, you have a wife. That's really about it. And he was, without a doubt, doing whatever he wanted to be doing. Um, and that's Henry VIII and his wives. So it's during this period, though, that Cranmer is cramming through uh, evangelical Lutheran ideas throughout England. And so you think about Henry and Cranmer, they're just total opposites. Cranmer is able, with a grace and even sometimes downright servitude, to exist almost as if his will at all times is just totally put on hold. He can't be open about his marriage. He, she's hidden this entire time. He can only be so open about what sorts of reforms he wants to take place. And Henry VIII would make an example. On one occasion, he just had a, a, a random Protestant and a random Roman Catholic killed on the same day to let everybody know, I'm not on this side and I'm not on that side. You all better be on this side. That was very much Henry VIII's mentality, and Cranmer could somehow exist in his world. 
I'll give you an example of this sort of thing. I don't, you know, no one knows what it was that Henry VIII had for Cranmer, but I think it is almost that they were so opposite that, that Henry VIII was just baffled by this guy. So on one occasion, Stephen Gardner, one of the opponents of Cranmer in his Re Reformation efforts, who wanted the church to be more Catholic, um, he had a plot to essentially call out Cranmer for being uh, against the king, working against him, uh, had all of these false accusations. He got all of these other lords to agree with it. And somehow the word got out to Henry VIII that they were after Cranmer, his boy, his main man. Well, he hears about it and he goes to Cranmer and he's like, listen, here's what they're saying about you. He's like, my lord, the king, you know, none of this is true. I haven't done anything to overthrow you. And he's like, yeah, you're probably right, Cranmer. That, that's right. Um, so they're, they're going to hold this trial, though. And uh, I'm going to have to let you go to it. And you're going to have to stand and he's like, yeah, OK, I'm planning to do that. I think they're still going to kill me no matter what, Henry. And so he takes off his ring and he goes, you go through the entire trial. And then at the very end of it, if they condemn you, I want you to pull this out <laughs> to let them know that you are completely under my graces. They do it. The entire plot, just this sham trial, all of this false accusation, everything. And at the very end, Cranmer pulls out the signet ring of Henry VIII, and everybody immediately is like, we're dead. And they're begging Cranmer for forgiveness because they, I mean, if Cranmer were to say, you guys, you know, off with your heads, they'd all be dead. I mean, he could have done that. But Cranmer didn't do that. He actually forgave every single one of them. And I think it's that sort of thing that Henry just could not believe about this guy. He just really seemed to conduct himself with this otherworldly piety that was so opposite to all of his ambitious pursuits. And that was the strange relationship between Henry VIII and Thomas Cranmer. And um, it didn't end there. I mean, this is one quote that I think just nails it. This is Henry VIII to Cranmer. He says, Oh Lord, what manner of man you are. What simplicity is in you. Do you not know how many great enemies you have? <laughs> and it was almost like it was the joy of Henry VIII to just thwart these powerful people because that's who he was and that's what he did. And Cranmer happened to be the guy in his graces and he was able therefore under the auspices and reign of such a tyrant to secure the Reformation cause in multitudinous ways. There are numerous stories about Cranmer's just general grace and kindness to people, including his political enemies. And he was a unique guy in that respect. I don't think Martin Luther could have managed with Henry VIII. I just don't think he could have. And so what you'll see by the end of this is that there's something of a compromise in what the Church of England is. And sometimes I think people will get on Cranmer's case for having been less principled. It's questionable whether guys like John Knox, who started the Presbyterian Church in Scotland, would have even survived if it weren't for men like Cranmer. So, Archbishop and Reformer. Well, Henry is coming to his death in 1547. He's such a blowhard. On one occasion, they were, you know, forget who they were at war with, but Henry walks into the room, and he's always been reticent to just get rid of Catholicism altogether. These traditions were deep in the veins of the English people, but he just walks in the room and says, why don't we just abolish the Mass? Cranmer's like, I've been saying that forever. That was been my plan. In fact, Cranmer's main work in the Reformation is a defense of the view that the body and blood don't literally change, the bread and the wine don't literally change into the body and blood of Christ, which people saw as kind of the linchpin of Catholics, you know, uh, rule over the people. If they're the only people who possess Christ physically in their hand and they refuse him to you, that's putting a lot of power into the hands of the clergy. And uh, Cranmer took that idea on head on and his main theological treatise. He had several really attacked that idea. But in any case, on Henry's deathbed, when he is barely even cognizant and present, he begs for, of all people, to come to his bedside, Thomas Cranmer. And bottom line is Cranmer, uh, you know, he's in his last moments before he's going to die. 
he he's he's worried is <laughs> i think you know given the life that he's lived one might be about what's to come and cramer sa- says simply uh, all your trust in christ is all your trust in christ and his mercy and uh, henry the eighth affirmed that it was that's a challenging idea it's a challenging idea for people today especially to say is Henry VIII, who would have been me too 2,000 times over, is Henry VIII in heaven with Christ and with the Lord? Um, and if we take seriously Cranmer's account of things, then, then he is. And what do you do with that when you have a world of people who think they're really righteous and really moral, who won't receive Christ, and they're not going to be there? Well, this opens up the, the, the brightest season of Cranmer's life. Cranmer gets to be with the great reformer king, Edward VI. Now, I'm going to tell you how Edward, old Edward was when he became king. He was nine years old. Augie, go ahead and raise, raise your hand, buddy. Raise your hand. That's a nine-year-old right there. Right there. A nine-year-old. Now, here's the thing. Cranmer was so savvy. He invested his heart, mind, and soul into the education of this boy for the nine years prior. He positioned himself to be Edward VI's greatest possible counselor. Now, it's noteworthy that King Josiah, he becomes king, I believe when he's eight years old, and everybody compared Edward to Josiah, the great reformer king. He reformed the religion in Israel because they had found the book of Deuteronomy again, and that's exactly what Edward was. And he's got Cranmer over his shoulder and he's saying, you know, Reformation cause. And you've got this kid who's like, yes, the Reformation. Yes. Yes. The Protestant. And he, it's hilarious. He had envisaged gathering all of the great reformers of Europe to England to produce one great reformed confession. He wanted to get Calvin and Bucer and um, Peter Martyr and all of these guys in one place. And in fact, it's during his reign we'll see that some of those guys do come to England and really advance the Reformation cause. Now, here are some of the things that happened under his reign. Cranmer's doing all this stuff. First, Cranmer writes a book of homilies, or a book of sermons, essentially. And it might seem crazy that your preacher would literally just read a sermon to you. But do you guys remember the sort of preachers I described? These men don't know the scriptures at all. So what in the course of time will seem restrictive to people of a Reformed and and Puritan mindset, having a book of pre-written sermons, it actually was an incredible advance on what they had at the time. You'd really just have men show up, they've memorized a Latin mass, and they don't even know what they're saying, and that's what church is. Well, these guys are actually going to read from the book of homilies biblical content and a message based on it, written by Cranmer and his associates. The other thing? Ministers can get married in England. That meant that finally Margaret could come out of hiding Cranmer's own wife and actually play the role of a host and a partner and show the dignity of the role of a pastor's wife in this country from the highest office of the clergy, which at that time was the archbishop. And of course, this is when he's writing and defending his views of the Lord's Supper In fact, this is the one point in Cranmer's life where he has a rather uh, distinct interaction with John Knox, the founder of the Scottish Presbyterian Church. Knox is hardcore. He's more Luther-esque. And because the book of Common Prayer still allowed people to bow in communion, it, it, it was something that Knox said should never be done. And he actually told Edward this. He got Edward's ear. And Cranmer was worried because he knew that this steady, slow reforming effort hung in the balance. But the argument was this on Knox's part, when you bow at the Lord's Supper, in the past, what that meant was you were regarding Jesus as being present and you were treating that as Jesus's body. You're adoring it as God itself. And that's why Knox said, we shouldn't do that. It's just regular bread and regular wine being used for a sacramental purpose. And So there was, uh, in the Book of uh, Common Prayer, a very explicit statement that, yes, you can bow at the supper, but not in worship or adoration of the elements. And that came during this period through his interaction with other reformers. So what a remarkable season it was to have this young man 
uh, be king. But in the course of time, uh, well, I'll mention a couple of other things. Um, they were actually ab able to get some of the great reformers from the continent to come and, and teach in Oxford and Cambridge. I, I believe uh, Peter Martyr, I believe he was at Cambridge, and I believe Martin Bucer was at Oxford. But you might remember Bucer was uh, the reformer in the city of Strasbourg, which is where Calvin spent a brief period of time and wanted to stay, actually. But he was a great and brilliant reformer. Peter Martyr was absolutely brilliant and can get his works now as they're increasingly being published in English. And John Olasco, the, the Polish reformer, he was the main pastor of um, refugees from, from all over Europe who were going to England because at this time under Edward, you could be Protestant and not have to worry for your life. And so it was an incredible boon for Protestantism in, the, in England at this time. Um, in the best years of Thomas Cramer's life, without a doubt. But the problem is, is that uh, Edward was sickly. I don't think he made it past, I want to say 13. I think he had a roughly four years. Um, in fact, it should be up here. 1547 to 1553. So he had six years. That, that, that's his reign. So he had six years. And um, they did everything they could to make sure that Edward would be succeeded not by Mary, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. Remember that first wife? Well, this is her daughter. Her mom was a Catholic, and she was determined to rain hell down on anyone who stopped the Catholic cause from going forth. And she had it out for Cranmer. Because you know who is responsible for the annulment? of Henry VIII's marriage to her, Thomas Cranmer. And that was that. And what this works out to is that very early on, I mean, Cranmer was very powerful and he was popular with some, but there were also those who wanted their old religion back. They wanted their old holidays back, their old manners of worship back. And so what she does is she has him in prison. And to be honest, for a, a period of time, really intense torture takes place on the part of Cranmer, both psychological and physical. They did all sorts of crazy things. They wanted to get him to recant the entire Protestant cause, and that was their goal. Manipulation of all sorts. They divested his best friends of their ministry. They, de they uh, executed his best friends in front of his eyes. And in fact, they even sent a, a prison bailiff or a prison guard to secretly befriend Cranmer and in the course of time, you know, just talk to him and eventually try to extract from him um, some sort of recanting of his Protestant belief. And he got so lonely that just having this one friend, this one prison guard who is sent with that specific task, um, he, he really, he would let his guard down in the course of time as we all would imaginably if we're being tortured and not well nourished and kept up late and seeing the torture of our friends dying. And so in 1556, he recants. There is, however, among the Protestants and the growing Puritan movement of the time, there are all sorts of disbeliefs, disbelief and theories, conspiracy theories that he had really recanted. People would say, no, that's just a forged signature. You know, he didn't really do that. And the question was, what was going on in the tower, in this prison that no one could really investigate? And at this time, Mary, really anyone who was of lesser significance than Thomas Cranmer, uh, you better run for your life. She had 284 people burned. That's just how many people she had burned alive for their Protestant belief, much less in prison, much less divested of their office or all their belongings sent into hiding. And Cranmer has to think the whole time, am I responsible for this? Did I do this? It's intense. So Bloody Mary eventually um, does, she, they go through a whole series of, of ordeals where Cranmer is getting investigated by the Pope. Because remember, there's been a pretty clean break with, uh, with the Roman church. She really wants for Cranmer to be excommunicated. 
But on the Roman Catholic theory of ordination, it's actually very hard to divest a priest of their office. That's one of the reasons you have the problems with scandal in the Roman Catholic Church with child abuse is because it just isn't that easy to get rid of a priest's office. If, if you could just take it away like that, you'd have to admit that you didn't actually impart a supernatural power to that person that just resides in their bones and their blood and their veins. And that's hard to admit. Well, what they did is the Pope required, after an initial vetting of Cranmer, the Pope required that Cranmer be present in Rome for his defense while he was imprisoned. So it's physically impossible for him to be present. If he doesn't show up, the threat was you're going to be excommunicated. Well, I mean, Mary made him stay in prison and he didn't show up. And so that was the essential effect of it. So here's what happens, though. Since he's recanted in, on March 21st, 1556, he is to show up to his own execution, where first a sermon would be preached by someone else. Then he would give a public uh, address wherein he would publicly recant. That was the plan. The sermon, it's just an incredible sermon that gets preached prior to Cranmer. The sermon argued that although Cranmer had recanted, and usually it's appropriate to show grace to people like that, nevertheless, Sometimes it's important to get tit for tat. And, you know, they did, after all, kill Sir Thomas More, the great Roman Catholic. So to really even the score, it's just, it's necessary to have this man executed. So that was in the sermon before he was to speak. So Cranmer himself preaches a sermon, a brief sermon where he talks about um, especially the importance of love for your neighbor. And then it's time for uh, recanting. Well, Thomas Cranmer turns on a dime, and he doesn't recant. In fact, he boldly proclaims, he, he says, many things that I have written have been in error or mistaken, and who couldn't say that? But the bulk of it, and my main works, are totally right. And moreover, because my hand right here was the instrument with which I recanted my Protestant faith, when I go to the flames, I will burn this hand off first because that was never what I really believed. And in fact, he got down from the podium and ran to the fire and they bound him up. And um, well, here it is. This is what he said. Anybody want to read? Go on. Oh. <laughs> and as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and antichrist with all his false doctrines. And as for the sacrament, I believe, as I have taught in my book, that it shall stand at the last day before the judgment of God, where the papal doctrines contrary thereto shall be ashamed to be so heretical. And he does it. In Fox's books, Book of Martyrs, John Fox, uh, you know, recounted the many martyrdoms throughout Mary's reign and uh, before it. And uh, he did just that. He literally held his hand in flames until his hand was more or less burned off and the rest of his body. You know, in fact, when it came to burning alive, it could go on for hours and hours and hours. It would essentially cauterize every wound that it formed. So you know, that would stop the blood flow as soon as the this, this skin would be broken to start it again. And he died for his faith. And this is just one example of someone at the time who died of their faith. He saw his friends, he saw many others do the very same thing. And this over things that today, you know, you'd seldom find a single person who would, would die for the things they believe and insist upon, um, the need for, for the gospel to be faithfully preached and for the word and sacrament to be rightly administered. But that's Thomas Cranmer. And so when we look at the Church of England today, here's what it's like. It's always been considered the kind of halfway reformed of the churches out there. It, it manifests kind of the warring tendencies 
of the kings and queens of England. The fact that you could have one king like Henry VIII, who's like, you know, he doesn't really care. Whatever works for him is going to be it. But then you have an Edward who is this, you know, mighty reformer king despite his age. And then you have a Bloody Mary who's just staunchly Roman Catholic. That is the flavor that you get when it comes to Anglicanism. And so in so many ways, like if you were to go into an Anglican service, it would look probably the most Catholic of all Protestant sorts of worship services. And in many respects, it it is the most Catholic. In the course of time, the Anglican Church is even going to develop a theory. It's a funny theory. It's that apostolic succession is necessary in any given church. So the only way someone can be a legitimate pastor is if they have been Uh, or rather bishop, is if they have had hands laid upon them by someone else who had hands laid upon them, going back to Peter. But they argue that the Roman church is the proper church for those who speak Latin languages, the Latin church. The Anglican church is the proper church and only true church for people who speak the English language. The Greek church is the true and only proper church for those who speak the Greek language. And somehow they kind of hang on to this idea of apostolic succession, kind of like Rome. But the big difference is that regional linguistic areas have to stick with their main archbishop. And that, that's what became you know, the high Laudian theory of... Um, Uh, after Archbishop Laud and and others like him, as to who really has authority in the church. So this is how Anglicans at their worst could go around and be like, hey, are you English? Are you Christian? You should be Anglican, period. Like, you don't get as many Anglicans today who would actually say that, but you certainly would have people in that universe and in that realm who would think that way. Now, I want to be clear. There are many, many, many Anglicans who are far better than that, who don't have that sort of linguistocentric view of, where you should have your church allegiance. But that's kind of become the character of the Church of England through the course of time, this kind of pendulum going back and forth between more Protestant and and kind of quasi-Catholic views of things. So anybody have any questions for me about the Church of England? Um, uh, Cranmer. Oh, more. More, right. Yeah. Um, and he was part of the committee that basically put the question to more over and over, you know, they acknowledged the uh, right of the king to marry, et cetera. And right. And then he didn't do that. But. That's right. That's right. That was his stand. That's the stand he took. And, you know, this does show something of the complexity of the Reformation for the Church of England, you know, to essentially have been started because of this king who kicks against all authority but his own is definitely a challenging thing. But it also points us to the fact this is something you guys should do in general when it comes to things political. Pray that the Lord would accomplish better things than the purposes and intents and plans of the people in authority and in power. I mean, much better things get accomplished. In fact, we'll see when we talk about John Knox in uh, the the Scottish church that he actually has a brief stay in England where it's safe during the reign of King Edward. And all of this gets set in motion by Cranmer. It's questionable whether or not John Knox ever could have had the influence in that realm if Cranmer had not carved out this space through his blood, sweat, and toil in England. And so that is the wild thing about all of this. And I think it's a little bit easier, I dare say, for Protestants than anyone else. See, we're not claiming anyone on planet Earth is infallible. We're not claiming that anyone on Earth is God's lone vicar before, you know, all of mankind. We can embrace the fact that some of the big players in human history and in this story have also been notorious sinners. And you get that even when you read the Bible. David's life after the Bathsheba incident is not good. His household is a mess, and yet he's still the Lord's. And it goes back to many of the things we even you know, reflected on today in our sermon, just that even our confessions of sin are not the sort of thing where we can put a feather in our hat and say, well, that's one good deed. Even those things are tainted by our base tendencies to seek out you know, attention, virtue, credit, all of those things. And I think you get that. You're able to embrace that a little bit more on a Protestant vision of things. 
I did want to just briefly, I'll just mention after um, Edward, that's when you get Elizabeth the first. She reigns for a very long time and she never gets married. So she's the virgin queen of England. But what she ushers in is basically a, an age or a time when um, she's a moderate Protestant, which allows the Protestant cause and the Puritans to exist. Puritans are the more radical reformers who want, want to see the church conformed very strictly to the word of God. Um, but they're allowed to exist at that time. And from that point forward, uh, England is Protestant. And she has a very long reign as well. Um, in fact, the American state of Virginia is named after her. She's the Virgin Queen, and uh, Virginia is, is therefore named after Elizabeth. But it does make for a period of um, relative peace and stability, and that's, that's what you get after Bloody Mary, because she doesn't last long. She's so radical, and essentially her own kind of turn against her, and um, it's not super surprising, I think you can imagine. But um, yeah, very tumultuous reign. Um, and what you'd expect with, with this sort of carnage and, and death that's going on. Yeah. So what happens to Mary? Yeah, you know, I'm, I, in the book I read on Cranmer, see, I'm trying to think. Uh, there was one failed attempted coup, um, but eventually I want to say that she, oh gosh, that's a really great question. I, I don't know if she flees or I don't know if she gets executed in England. I think she flees to Spain, I think is the answer. That's my guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, definitely not that. And she does not melt. That's true. Yeah, but uh, that's a great question. I mean, I came prepared mainly to talk about Cranmer, but I'm not, I'm not totally sure, but I'm sure you could Wikipedia that and get your answer right away. Any other questions about the Church of England? No? Well, here's the thing. You know, we're, we got about, I want to say a little, just a little over, just right around 20 minutes ago, and I'm not going to be able to finish I'm not going to be able to finish John Knox in that time. So we'll call this good for this installment. And I hope you guys, again, go leave with a greater understanding of where these different denominations and different ideas are coming from. And just the strange ways in which, um, you know, the changing of the guard takes place. And, um, yeah, let's come having read the chapter on the beginnings of the Scottish church next time. That is an amazing ring. I mean, I think Jerry, like... <laughs> Oh, well, that's, you know, I guess you get criticized one way or the other. <laughs> All right, guys, well, let's pray, and we'll call it a day. Who'd like to pray? Ask the Lord to just bless our uh, learning and our meeting. Michael loves to pray. Let's do it. Yeah. Lord, thank you for this time that we get to uh, hear Pastor Brandt uh, uh, bring us uh, the great reformers. And, and Lord, I pray that um, we, would, uh, we would be made fit to do the work of your kingdom. Lord, bless uh, both our activities as we go in from today and Lord, as we reflect on these great men uh, and, the, and the places that you put them. Lord, I pray that we would, um, as we think about our own places, we'd be in seek to seek your word and, and uh, apply it uh, in a way that, that glorifies you. Lord, make us fit to do the work in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.